evening. This is Aaron O'Toole, leader of the Conservative Party of Canada. I'm thrilled to welcome you to our telephone town hall tonight. We're also live on Facebook and YouTube. Tonight, we're talking to people from across British Columbia about the path to recovery and how Canada's Conservatives will secure the future. You'll have the chance to ask me any question you have about this election, and particularly any question you have about Canada's recovery plan, our plan to secure the future and get the country back on its feet. If you have a question, please press star three now, and you can ask me live in this telephone town hall. This past year and a half has been incredibly difficult. Across the country, Canadians have lost loved ones, and hardworking Canadians have lost their jobs. There's a cost of living crisis right now in Canada. And there's forest fires, the images of which are heartbreaking in British Columbia. Instead of focusing on helping our friends in BC on recovery, on the situation in Afghanistan, Justin Trudeau called an election. He put his own interests ahead of the national interests. And last week he said that he doesn't think about monetary policy and inflation because he doesn't think it impacts families. Only a Prime Minister totally disconnected from the real needs of Canadian families would say something like that. And the Liberals, the NDP and the Greens do not understand that running massive deficits year after year, driving away jobs and investment, that leads to inflation, which causes prices to skyrocket, gas, groceries. There's already a housing crisis in BC and has been for years. It also puts our social safety net at risk. So the timing of this election is completely reckless. The government should be focused on helping Canadians, tackling the issues in front of our country. But Mr. Trudeau, once again, is putting his own agenda ahead of the needs of the country. So tonight, you'll be able to ask questions about our plan, Canada's recovery plan. And it's important because Mr. Trudeau doesn't have a plan. In fact, in recent days, Michael, we've heard that he's calling for his candidates and and other people to just give him some wow ideas, some big ideas, because after six years, he has no plan. As Canadians uh, and voters should be very deeply concerned that we're in an election with a prime minister with no vision for the future. 12 years in the military taught me many things, but most importantly, you always need a plan for every mission. We have the plan, we're going to secure the future, and for British Columbia, every part of BC's economy needs to have an economic recovery. And our healthcare system that has been affected by this pandemic is also at stake. So Canada's Conservatives will stand up for hardworking Canadians and their families. We have a plan to have an historic investment of $60 billion over the next decade in our healthcare system. And we're ready to deliver a plan that has an economic recovery in all sectors of our economy, including forestry, including natural resources, including the great tech and entrepreneurs we see in British Columbia all sectors in all regions. We're gonna recover a million jobs in our first year. We're gonna secure accountability by cleaning up the mess and having anti-corruption laws in Ottawa. We're gonna secure mental health by delivering a Canada Mental Health Action Plan. And we're gonna secure the country by building capacity here at home for future pandemics. And we will balance the budget over the course of the next decade. We also have a very comprehensive plan to fight climate change. We're going to meet our Paris targets and get the country working again. In fact, we worked with a BC climate change modeling firm to help our country reduce emissions, allow Canadians to get a feeling for their carbon footprint and make greener choices. All of these things we need to do over the next few years because this election should really be about the future. And the choice is this, who do you trust to secure the future for your family? There may be five parties out there but there's only two choices, Canada's Conservatives or more of the same with Mr. Trudeau, the NDP and the Greens. So I'm looking forward to answering your questions, discussion, as I said, please press star three or leave a comment in Facebook or YouTube and we'll try and pull a few questions from there as well. Any question you have for us tonight is, is, is open, open season. And who's gonna pick these questions and get the, the, the meeting going? Our amazing, candidate for Leeds Grenfell Thousand Islands, our ethics critic in the last parliament, and boy, with Mr. Trudeau as prime minister, our ethics critic was very busy, Michael Barrett.
Well, it's a real pleasure to join you this evening, Aaron. Uh, uh, folks, as he said, uh, my name is Michael Barrett, and I'm the candidate in Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands, and Rideau Lakes. And um, as a member of Aaron's team, I'm so proud to be able to tell you that I support Aaron O'Toole's vision for Canada, and uh, it, it's a real pleasure to be with him tonight. Aaron was raised in Bowmanville, Ontario, a community with middle-class values of hard work and helping your neighbor. neighbor. And he served in uh, the Royal Canadian Air Force for 12 years and has proudly represented the riding of Durham in the House of Commons since 2012. Aaron stands up for hardworking Canadians. He wants to work for you and make sure that for generations to come, Canadians can grow up with world-class services, a healthy economy, healthy finances, and a clean environment. So the telephone town hall is about to start. So please press star three to ask Aaron O'Toole any question. And if you have any question at all, press star three on your phone. So our first question has to do with affordability. We'll get right into it with Anthony. You are live with Aaron O'Toole, the leader of Canada's Conservatives. Aaron, appreciate what you're doing here. What can you what what are you going to do to secure our trust? in British Columbia right now, typically with like the cost of living. We've seen housing skyrocket in the last two years. Gas prices are insanely high right now. Just everything. We, it, it's unaffordable to travel. Just expenses are through the roof. What are you going to do to secure our trust? Great question, Anthony, and thank you for giving me the chance to secure your trust. And our plan wants to secure your future, and the affordability crisis you're talking about uh, is the number one thing we've heard for many, many months, which is why we're trying to tackle it here. And ground zero for the housing crisis has been British Columbia for many years. So just a few days ago, I put forward a very comprehensive plan to tackle the housing crisis. The federal government has a role to play alongside the municipalities and the provinces, and we put forward serious policies to actually make a difference for families. We're going to ban foreign non-resident purchases of real estate. We saw that driving up real estate values in British Columbia, and we're going to ban it for two years. Mr. Trudeau has, has nibbled around the edges with a 1% surcharge. That's just the cost of doing business. We can't allow people that have no intention of living here to push real estate values completely out of uh, out of reach for average families. We're also going to free up 15% of the land and buildings the federal government holds in our property holdings. We're a big property owner as a federal government to try and accelerate development because we have to have supply to help address this crisis. We're also going to make sure infrastructure investments for, for transit tie to density. And for first-time buyers, Anthony, we want to make sure that there's more certainty in a, in a time that's very uncertain. So we're going to have longer mortgage terms, allow people to lock things in, and more fairness with respect to stress tests and other things. So we've got a comprehensive suite that I put out right away because we deserve action, not empty words and inaction by Mr. Trudeau for six years. On the inflation crisis, for highest inflation in 18, 19 years, we have to tackle that by getting spending under control and our Recovery plan has a plan to get back to balance over the course of the next decade. We need to get folks working in all sectors and all regions. And we've got some specific measures in terms of keeping taxes low and even giving some tax breaks. A GST holiday in December allow families to kind of catch up in a little way with some purchases at the end of the year, but tying that to bricks and mortar purchases only. It's not for an online order from the states. It's for helping the, the mom and pop shops and the retailers who've struggled across the country um, with that end of year GST holiday, kind of a little bonus for, for, those, for those small businesses. We're going to try and bring some purchases into those stores to help them survive. So we hear you, Anthony. Canada's Conservatives are the only party with a serious plan to tackle the affordability crisis for Canadians. So we're going to go next to uh, Lynn from Prince Rupert with a question uh, about the debt. So, Lynn, you are live now with Aaron O'Toole. Go ahead. Hi. I am deeply concerned with how deep in debt this, con this country is right now, not only B.C., but federally as well. There's been so much money given out, I don't see how you can recover it without 
taxation, which could affect not only us but our children, maybe even grandchildren, to ever get back on a level basis. How do you plan to handle that? Uh, I, I have the same fears that you do, Lynn. Um, the debt that Mr. Trudeau is accumulating is going to be on the shoulders of our children and grandchildren, and that's why our fourth pillar of Canada's recovery plan is a plan to get back to balance, helping businesses and highly affected sectors get on their feet, helping with mental health and some of the, the social toll that the pandemic will take, but have a clear plan to wind down expenditures. Mr. Trudeau has been continuing to just extend the same benefits he started at the beginning of the pandemic. He hasn't taken benefits away from sectors that are having record profits. He's not helping the most highly affected. We have to get people working again and not just extending Serbs into some sort of universal basic income, which seems to be the goal of the Liberals, the NDP and the Greens. So we need to get folks working and then tackle the debt. Mr. Mr. Trudeau has the debt on track to be $1.3, $1.4 trillion. And with inflation a risk, interest rate increases a risk on the horizon, we could see having challenges with health care and with old age security. Mr. Trudeau's putting those programs at risk. So we're going to secure them. Historic investments in health care and getting our economy working, but then reduce, reduce that expenditure and get back to balance. We've picked a 10-year time frame because we think that's fair, Lynn. And the tax increases, we're choosing 10 years as well because we want to keep taxes low. We will fight tooth and nail against any effort to, to extend to the taxation of personal residences and the sale of that. There's a lot of fear about that because CMHC has been doing a study in the last few years and CRA is tracking home values. Mr. Trudeau, we have fears, is looking at a big solution of a tax increase like that to deal with his massive spending. The final thing I'll say, we put forward this plan on the second day of the campaign that we don't think should be on right now because of fires in BC, the fourth wave, the Delta variant. Mr. Trudeau forced an election and doesn't have a plan. Canadians deserve better than that. So we're going to take more of your questions, but we have a question for you. And uh, if you would like to tell us um, what you're, how you're going to vote in this election on September 20th. You can press 1 if you're going to be supporting Aaron and the Conservative Party of Canada. Press 2 if you're supporting another party. Or press 3 if you're unsure. And if you want to ask a question live to Aaron, you can press star 3 to get in the queue. Our next question is about climate change, and it comes from Ivan. Ivan, you are live now with Aaron O'Toole. Hello. Um, thanks for putting this on. Uh, I live on uh, southern Vancouver Island. We're in the middle of a level four drought. Uh, our local government is telling us that this is uh, going to be the new normal and that it, it is a direct consequence of a changing climate. Uh, we've never experienced this before. And uh, not having water, I can tell you here, is a huge issue. Our water is depleting. So I'm particularly concerned that the uh, intergovernmental panel on uh, the UN intergovernment panel on climate change has uh, suggested or in fact is advising governments and societies to immediately transition from uh, fossil fuel uh, power sources to uh, non-fossil fuel power sources. So I would, um, my question is, uh, does the, the, our conservative plan uh, will it be innovative and far-looking and immediately push for a transition from fossil fuels to other fuel sources? Um, and that, does, that would include no longer supporting pipelines and no longer supporting the oil sands and the continued uh, support and government subsidies for fossil fuels in Canada. And, and I think this is a, a very dire issue right now, and I can see it out my window right now when I look at the situation we're facing here in British Columbia and in parts of uh, Western Canada and Western North America. Thanks, Aaron. Thank you very much, Ivan. We are seeing the impacts of climate change, uh, drought conditions, absolutely, as you're saying, on Vancouver Island. The, the forest fire and the heat waves before the, the forest fire season in the interior of British Columbia. And we are going to have to be more resilient in communities uh, to tackle this. So, 
yes, we're going to have a very serious climate change plan in this election, and we do because I launched it in April. It's, it's in here. It's the first major policy I've put out as leader because Conservatives, we do have to restore some trust with people on the environment. People weren't satisfied with the level of detail or commitment in the plans we put forward in the last two elections. So as leader, I said it was important for us to have a plan to meet our emission reduction targets in Paris and try and minimize the disruption on jobs and investment as much as possible, Ivan. That's what I think we've struck the balance on here. We're, we're pricing carbon. We're trying to work with large emitters and with all Canadians, which with our plan, actually Canadians would see what their carbon footprint is through a price on carbon that then would go into their low carbon savings account and allow them to make purchases to then lower that carbon footprint. It's an innovative plan that we worked with an environmental consultancy based out of British Columbia to try and make sure we had smart policy to meet our emission reduction targets, but minimize economic disruption. And when it comes to energy, the, the globe will be using, hydrocarbons will be using oil and gas for decades to come. We have to get emissions down. We have to also recognize that every time Canadian energy is taken out of the mix, Ivan, it's going to be replaced by a country who doesn't have our same commitment on emission reduction, doesn't have our same commitment on human rights, on overall governance, on partnerships with Indigenous communities. So over the decades to come, I think Canada can be an ESG leader, environmental social governance, get our emissions down, and leverage Canadian innovation to sequester carbon, to generate electricity through small modular reactors. So our plan is has a price on carbon, but also has major elements on renewable natural gas standards, similar to what the Horgan government announced. Electric vehicles, major commitments on technologies to get emissions down. So I think it has to be a all of government, all of society effort to make sure we meet our commitments. That's what Canadians should be known for. But make sure we also have an economic recovery and, and work with industry on, on net zero programs and others. So Ivan, you sounds like you, you know a lot about the subject. Please check out our plan. There's a lot of detail in it. And please tell folks in your writing that the Conservatives have a plan and we want to be held to account for it. Folks, if you have a question for Aaron O'Toole, press star three on your keypad now. Our next question comes from Barb, and it is about um, manufacturing. Barb, go ahead. You're live with Aaron O'Toole now. Hi there. I just wanted to know, do you have any plans of stopping sending out all our raw resources and starting to do manufacturing here in Canada? I mean, we should be self-sufficient and, um, you know, not in poverty the way we are. Well, thanks, Barb, for, for the question. And, you know, this is an interesting issue that comes up quite a bit, is why aren't we doing... Uh, secondary processing, why aren't we upgrading our resources and, and making things here? Um, we do want to see more self-reliance and more abilities to do that. It's why we have to work with our allies to actually restore fairness and the rule of law in international trade. If you look, take British Columbia as an example, the aluminum in Kitimat is some of the greenest aluminum in the world. But under our NAFTA agreement, Mr. Trudeau allowed Mexico to take transshipped Chinese aluminum to make auto parts to sell in North America. Chinese aluminum can often be seven times more carbon intense than ours. We have an auto parts industry in, in Canada, especially in my part of southern Ontario. Why are we not securing that? Why are we letting the, the communist government in China game the system. This is something the Americans, going back to President Obama, first started to try and address. Mr. Trudeau has been out of line with the Americans with respect to China, with respect to trade in steel and aluminum. So I want to make sure we don't allow that to happen. It hollows out jobs. It hollows out our capacity as a country. So our fourth pillar of our plan is building up domestic capacity and resilience as a country in vaccines and other areas, but also in critical industries where we'd like to see more free and fair trade 
amongst democratic countries and less abuse by countries that don't follow environmental uh, rules, don't fire out, follow human rights rules. So, Barb, we want to see more of these jobs retained in Canada, more capacity, and we're going to stand up for working families as we do it. If you have a question for Aaron, you can ask by pressing star 3, or you can ask your question in the comments on Facebook. We have a question from Lisa who asks, British, the British Columbia interior is burning and so many have lost everything, home, businesses, and land. Trudeau came to Vancouver last week and poured beer. How will Alberta and B.C. recover with the CPC and a majority government? Alberta and B.C. families are hurting bad. Well, thanks for the question, Lisa, and I'm glad folks are on, on Facebook and YouTube. This was one of the big, really selfish things about this election for Mr. Trudeau, trying to uh, call a snap election to try and get a majority, and B.C. was having some of the worst fire seasons in living memory. We have a whole range of other issues, including some variant outbreaks in parts of the interior of B.C. as well. Rather than us working together and tackling these things, Mr. Trudeau's having an election. We have a plan here that would address some of these natural disaster uh, situations where we're having huge emergencies and there needs to be a role for the federal government to partner with the provinces. I called last week for the Canadian Armed Forces to be made available as soon as the BC government wants to deploy them to help rural communities, to help First Nation communities. We also want to have disaster recovery and disaster planning assistance at the highest levels of the Prime Minister's office and the Privy Council office. So we have that in our plan. We want infrastructure investments to help communities build resilience, resiliency for the impacts of climate change, which as Ivan said is already happening both in terms of droughts, but also more severe forest fire seasons. And any way we can build capacity to, to help infrastructure help communities prepare, we will do that. And as I said, Lisa, we want to see an economic recovery, not just in one or two parts of the country or not just in a couple of sectors, which it seems Mr. Trudeau wants to build back better. So that means he's going to help this sector, but not this one, maybe this region and not this. We want all cylinders in our economic engine firing. That includes a softwood lumber agreement for British Columbia. That means standing up for the tech sector in, in Lower Mainland. That means fisheries and a Pacific salmon strategy. That's in our plan as well. So, Lisa, B.C. will not be an afterthought, as it is with Mr. Trudeau. We need our Asia-Pacific gateway to be firing to help our whole country recover and get back on track after COVID. Folks, we've heard Aaron O'Toole answer a couple of your questions so far, and we're going to ask... Uh, you to press star three if you have a question for Aaron, and we're going to get to some of the folks who've asked questions. But um, while we do that, if you'd like to indicate if you're going to be supporting Aaron and the Conservative Party in the September 20th election, you can press one on your keypad now, press two if you're supporting another party, or press three if you're unsure, undecided so far. Uh, we have another question. This one comes from Rob. And it's about a, uh, a subject that I've been uh, um, keenly aware of, and that's uh, integrity and, uh, and ethics um, with this government. So, Rob, you can ask your question with Aaron O'Toole right now. Good day, Mr. O'Toole. Um, my question is about integrity and how is the Conservative Party and yourself going to prove to us or show us that you have more integrity than Liberals have shown? I'm talking specifically about Mr. Trudeau, and the fact that he called out Admiral Norman publicly on international news and said that man is going to be charged when it was proved that nothing was done wrong and Mr. Trudeau has not apologized to this day to Admiral Norman. And now Admiral McDonald apparently has been fired from the Chief of Defence Staff position with no charges. And now Mr. Trudeau is asking us to give him his job back but Admiral McDonald doesn't get his job back because he was just accused of something. So how are you going to show more integrity or prove to us that you have more integrity than this person who seems to be self-serving and uh, will just do whatever he wants? 
What a great question, Rob. And I will often say when I was in the private sector and involved in some hiring decisions, the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior. And Mr. Trudeau is a prime minister that has been on under investigation for his own ethical conduct three times. The ethics commissioner, and we joke how busy Michael is, has to number the inquiries into Mr. Trudeau one, two, and three. There's been so many investigations. And what signal does that send to his team when the prime minister is constantly breaking ethics laws? There's no consequences and clearly almost no degree of shame because Mr. Trudeau on his first breach took a, an illegal holiday, not just himself and some close friends, he took the president of the Liberal Party on this illegal trip. There's a culture of entitlement around the Trudeau team that really needs to change. And Admiral Mark Norman is a truly honourable Canadian. I've known him for several years. I've known his father who served in the military and he, he has either been a part of a military family or been a military family himself his entire life. And to think that Mr. Trudeau was willing to throw people like that under the bus after his own cabinet tried to try to interfere in the awarding of a naval shipbuilding contract. This happened in the first few weeks of the Trudeau government. So within weeks of getting into power, the Liberals were helping the interests of, of friends and insiders, and people became expendable. And it has to stop, and it will stop, because the second pillar of our recovery plan, Rob, is the toughest transparency and accountability laws in Canadian history. Why do we need such tough laws? Because we've had the most cover-up prone and quite frankly the most ethically corrupt government in our history when the Prime Minister is sending a signal like that. So we're going to close loopholes in lobbying. We're going to put sanctions in place for every breach of an ethical violation and rising sanctions as the severity and the repetition of the breaches go. You know, Bill Morneau resigned after his second ethics investigation, Mr. Trudeau is still there, and as you said, not giving other people the right to even defend themselves like Mr. Mr. Norman was, was fired, and Mr. Trudeau's office covered up allegations with respect to sexual misconduct in the Canadian Armed Forces. Where's the accountability for Mr. Sajan, who knew for three years? Justin Trudeau's office, who knew for three years? Canadians deserve better. We deserve a government that is ethical, and my, my future conduct can be predicted by how I've conducted myself in my political career as my time as minister. I bring people together and get things done. We will get our recovery plan done and restore faith in government, Rob. Very well said. And our next question is on daycare. It comes from Harvey in Campbell River. You can go ahead now with Aaron O'Toole, Harvey. Mr. O'Toole, I can't thank you enough for putting this on tonight. Um, and I must say, while I was uh, waiting for you to come online, I actually found the donation page for our local, local candidate and did that. Uh, My kids you. live in Calgary, and their daycare costs are spiraling out of control. Um, and I'm wondering what the plan is to try and get women back in the workplace. Great question, Harvey. And... This has been one of the huge impacts of, of the economic shock from COVID-19. It has adversely impacted women, young people, some minority communities, and there's really been no plan to, to address those higher impacted sectors. And so we have a plan to address them. Hospitality, tourism, travel, restaurants, a higher number of female entrepreneurs in those sectors. I've met with some groups where about 70% of their members in these organizations were, were women entrepreneurs. So we're going to have targeted supports within the first pillar, our million jobs pledge. And as Michael and I would know, one of our future workforce development shadow ministers, Raquel Dancho, she's 30. She challenged Mr. Trudeau in the House to say all of the gains in her lifetime for women in the workplace have been lost. Um, pretty striking, and there's really no plan from Mr. Trudeau to address that. So we 
are going to empower parents to have more resources, more direct support for childcare. Our plan will apply to all families immediately and folks in the lower income bracket, some will get up to 75% of their costs covered. So we're making it reflective of need. I think it's fair. I think we can roll it out quickly. And that gives flexibility because we've, if we've learned anything from COVID, there's going to be a changing workforce. With shift work and other demands, we need to let families make the best decision on what suits their need. Mr. Trudeau's plan, maybe some families are uh, getting a spot five to six years from now, but probably not if you're rural or suburban, all uncertain, all signed at the last minute before an election. It's not a real plan. Our plan will put families in the driver's seat. And as I said, help some of the families at the lower revenue uh, end of the spectrum the most. They need our help. We need to get this country working again. If you have a question for Aaron O'Toole, press star three on your phone now. Our next question comes from Richard, who wants to ask uh, Aaron, uh, he wants to ask you about your record as a minister in the Harper government. Go ahead, Richard, you're live with Aaron O'Toole now. Here's a question for you. Uh, you were part of the Harper government for I don't know, three or four years before he was defeated. Mr. Harper, one, never refused to meet with the provinces, with the, with the, with the premiers on health care. And, and, and two, um, all, she also took very little, if any, action towards climate change. If you're elected prime minister, why would things change now? You were part of that government. Well, thanks, Richard. Um, I'm a new leader with a new approach. And what I've been with Canadians in my literally to almost the day year as conservative leader has been trying to tell them about my record and our vision for the challenges facing Canada in 2021, coming out of the worst health and economic crisis in our, in our lifetime, certainly in the last hundred years. So that's why, Richard, on the first full day of the campaign, we launched a plan. It's my commitment. It has five pillars, as I said, a million jobs accountability, national leadership on mental health, more self-reliance in critical items and balancing the budget. There's also a lot of special initiatives on everything from, from uh, Pacific Salmon and, and BC specific initiatives, right through to our personal commitment on, on ethics and accountability. My, uh, my approach in terms of leadership federally I've said I want to have a federalism of partnership. I had a very good goal uh, in my first months as leader with Premier Horgan. In fact, there's some areas that I know from an economic standpoint, getting people back to work, getting a softwood lumber agreement, more certainty. We saw seven mills in the last 24 months close in British Columbia. I will work with all premiers regardless of stripe. And even today, I said we should be doing that on health care. Not having the federal government, Mr. Trudeau, attacking premiers, attacking things they're trying to do to help their citizens. I trust premiers and will respect provincial and, and federal relations and jurisdiction. That will be my approach. And I think working together after COVID is the way to do it. On climate change, I've said, Richard, I think I've even said it tonight with Ivan, we have to restore some trust because I don't think we had a detailed enough plan with measurable targets in the last two elections. So as a leader, I wanted to make sure we had such a plan and I want to be accountable for it, which is why it's in Canada's recovery plan. But the interesting thing, Richard, it's the one major part of the plan that I put out in April. Why is that? Because I recognize we have to earn some trust. We also had it verified by a third party. So this isn't just Aaron O'Toole and Michael Barrett making this up on the fly. We spent months consulting. We hired modeling experts to make sure we can achieve our Paris commitments, but also make sure we get the country moving again after COVID-19. And Richard, as a leader, I'm putting this out to you to consider to secure our future. And I hope I can earn your trust. If you have a question for Aaron O'Toole, you can press star three on your phone now. Uh, one of the things, Aaron, that I find really interesting about uh, this plan, and you've talked about a few of the different parts, and we're going to take some more questions, is, um, is the depth of the plan, 
but it's, it's, I'm really proud to be part of a, t- a team with such great uh, bench strength, really, a really deep bench, and we have fantastic candidates um, in B.C. We absolutely do, and, you know, when I was there a month and a half ago uh, with our candidate Shelley Downey in North Island, Powell River, Shelley's been an entrepreneur, a mom. She's been on council multiple terms, so has that experience. It was the same when I was in the interior in South Okanagan, West Kootenay, Helena Conan's same track record, businesswoman uh, involved in local council and local volunteer events. I also learned she was a national rated tennis player back in the day, actually uh, represented Canada at Wimbledon, I think. So it's a really neat story. Uh, in Cowich in Malahat Langford, we have Alana DeLong, who has experience as a provincial uh, MLA. We have a human rights and, uh, lawyer in Tamara Cronus in Nanaimo, Ladysmith, Mary Lee in Courtney, Alberta. We've got, we've got an incredible set of candidates. Uh, Skeena Bulkley Valley, Claire Rattay, uh, uh, business owner, entrepreneur. Uh, and if you notice, a lot of the writings we're talking to tonight, an incredible slate of women entrepreneurs and leaders. I'm very proud that in 2021, in this election, the Conservatives will have the most diverse, uh, the highest number of, of female candidates, and we're all committed to a plan to secure the future for the country. I think that's what Canadians deserve. I like to joke, listen, it makes a thud. We took time to get this right. Mr. Trudeau is sending out notes to his team saying, send me some ideas, give me your wow factor. Wow, he's been prime minister for six years and he's out of gas. He has no ethical command as as prime minister and we see cynicism in in politics as, as Rob said from the Admiral Norman case to to the scandals you cover as our ethics shadow minister canadians deserve better i think it's a time for change i want canada's conservatives to earn your vote so back to your questions now and we're going to go to michael who has a question about human trafficking michael you are live with aaron o'toole thank you and and thank you for the opportunity to ask a question i'm wondering what a conservative government's plan would be to address the issue of human trafficking, particularly sex trafficking in Canada. There are estimates that it might be in the range of 20,000 uh, victims, most of them are Canadians, and perhaps about half of them Indigenous uh, persons. The, the current government has, has done essentially nothing uh, through a little bit of money uh, at, at uh, advertising prevention programs, and uh, there's just so much more that needs to be done. I agree with you 100%, Michael. Uh, In fact, one of the most heartbreaking uh, areas of of criminality is in human trafficking. Uh, Some people say it's almost a modern form of slavery where people are are coerced, threatened, and brought into uh, being trafficked, sometimes being forced into prostitution. And this highly impacts people that are already vulnerable people with, in some cases, from a broken home, uh, people that are new Canadians that have come to Canada or have been brought here under false pretenses, uh, Indigenous young people. This was an area we made progress when the Conservatives were in government. We set up a program that funded some of the outreach efforts going on along across the country with, with police organizations and other groups. Even when Mr. Trudeau was running $25 billion deficits before COVID, he had big deficits. He cut this human trafficking program just because it was from the previous conservative government. And I'll tell you that's unacceptable. So in our plan, we have a criminal justice system that will be very severe on people that abuse other people, that prey on the vulnerable and bring violence to our communities. Our plan will show compassion for people with an addiction or a mental health issue. I think that's what we need to have, a justice system that goes after people that prey and, and, and abuse other people and abuse the trust of our democracy. And we're going to work with law enforcement. Michael, reestablish that action approach on, on human trafficking. And I'll tell you, we've had a lot of our MPs, including my neighbor, Colin Carey, uh, in Ontario, putting forward private members' bills, working with victims, rights groups, we will make this a priority because I'll tell you, it is a scourge that we have to wipe out of our communities. If you have a question you want to ask, Aaron, you can press star three on your phone. 
Uh, I have a quick question for you. If you haven't already participated in the survey, um, please do so now. If you're going to be supporting uh, the Conservative candidate in your riding in this election, press 1. If you're voting for one of the other parties, press 2. And if you're unsure, press 3. So we're going to go to uh, Marlene in Smithers next, and she has a question about Serb. Marlene, you're live now. Hi, I just had a question about um, the Serb and whether the Conservatives will look towards the um, uh, question about Serb and whether the Conservatives will look towards um, helping out. Some of the employers I talked to say that nobody is applying, um, that forestry workers, they're short of seasonal workers to help fight the fires here in BC. And some employees are telling their um, previous employers that they can't afford to come back because part-time work um, actually makes them lose money because they're making enough money on CERB to sit at home. So I'm wondering what the plan is with the Conservatives for that. Thank you, Marlene. This is something I hear from coast to coast to coast is some sectors of the economy cannot find employees. So there are job opportunities, and this is what is frustrating. There's job opportunities. In some areas of the country, we have high and chronic unemployment, higher levels, people not hired back. And then we've got shortages in some parts of our economy. A lot of that has been caused by the fact that Mr. Trudeau, once we got through the first two waves of the pandemic, we needed to adjust the programs to help the highly impacted sectors and workers in those sectors. There were other sectors. Some corporations were making record profits and still receiving taxpayer assistance. That is just wrong. And it's part of the reason why Mr. Trudeau's accumulated almost half a trillion dollars of debt. So we needed to pivot the programs to be where they're needed, support the people that were really going to be long-term affected from, from lockdowns and restrictions and no travel and tourism industry, for example, and not have a general CERB as an emergency benefit for month after month after month. And of course, with an election coming that Mr. Trudeau was planning, he just kept kicking the, the, the can down the, the road on CERB. The programs need to be wound down unless there's a, a major outbreak and we're back into restrictions. We have to make sure they're wound down and get people working. It's why, Marlene, in our plan, Canada's recovery plan, we have a job surge. We're going to reverse the approach of Mr. Trudeau, paying people not to work. We're going to incentivize hiring. And in fact, with employers, we're going to pay 25% of the six-month first salary for every new employee, 50% if that employee has been unemployed for 10 months or more, because we know chronic employment have a harder time breaking back into the workforce, so we're going to incentivize that. We're going to give targeted support to the highly impacted sectors that will have a slower recovery, but we need to get the country working again. And here's the big difference, Marlene. We are the only party that has not, either through their party declarations or their policies, said that we can't turn the CERB into a UBI basic income. That's what the Liberals and the NDP will do. That will hollow out our ability to invest in health care, as we're going to do at record amounts, to invest in mental health and wellness, to, to make sure we tackle climate change and, and have a serious commitment to reconciliation. For all of those important things, we need a strong economy. We need to wind down the, the programs that are incentivizing people not to work and get the country working again. Our next question comes from Alan, and Alan has a question um, about facilitating small businesses. Alan, you're live with Aaron now. Hi, Aaron. I appreciate this opportunity to ask you this question. My big concern is um, the economy depends on the small engine of small business pe uh, businesses being healthy and stimulating our economy. It's so important, and Trudeau has totally ignored that. I think the whole nation is hungry for the flip flop to get back to stimulating small business, they will hire people and then those people will spend money and stimulate the economy, especially after COVID. What is your plan uh, and where, where can you uh, implement your plan to facilitate small business to do this? 
Well, thanks, Alan. You nailed it. Small business, small and medium-sized businesses need to recover for us to secure the future. In fact, two-thirds of Canadians work for a small or medium-sized business. So we have to make sure we let those, help those businesses survive to thrive later so that we have people working. And I'm very proud to say that's at the core. Page 21 of Canada's recovery plan is supporting small business, rebuilding Main Street, a tax credit to encourage other Canadians to invest in a business on Main Street, extra support to highly impacted sectors, making sure that we also get people working through our job surge program, and ensuring that we fix government procurement and a range of things that have often excluded small and medium-sized businesses. We need to be more self-sufficient, more self-reliant, and we should certain be, certainly be procuring things for the government, you know, for large industries, from Canadian, from Canadian companies and sources. So if other countries restrict the ability for us to sell there, we're going to have more local buy Canadian. We need to work with the Americans so that we can have a buy Canada US. That really needs to be our approach. And we're going to tackle everything from credit and debit fees and, and other barriers to those small businesses earning a margin. Final thing I'll say, Alan, our GST holiday in December has two key purposes. One, we want to help families. They need a break. There's a cost of living crisis right now, and at the holiday season comes, it'd be nice if people had a little bit of flexibility for an extra gift for their kid or their partner. The other side of why we're doing this, the purchases will only be eligible for that GST holiday in bricks and mortar stores. We want to see retailers have a bit of surge of commercial consumer activity after a very difficult year and a half for small and medium-sized businesses. So, Alan, you said it perfectly. We need a real plan for small and medium-sized businesses. No, Mr. Trudeau, they're not tax cheats. They're actually employing people and building up our communities from small towns to big cities. And Canada's recovery plan will have their back. Our next question comes from George, and it has to do with uh, addressing gun violence. George, you're live now with Aaron O'Toole. Uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to address this issue. But, uh, Mr. O'Toole, I was wondering, how are you going to address the increased gun violence that uh, seems to be spreading across Canada? Uh, Mr. Trudeau seems to be going about it the wrong way. Every gun... Every shooting is politicized, and he seems to be targeting the legal gun owners, which we know have absolutely nothing to do with the gun violence. The gun violence is uh, perpetrated by criminal gangs, which do not care about legal guns or illegal guns. They get their guns no matter what. So it appears that Mr. Trudeau is targeting all the legal gun owners that are law-abiding the most scrutinized and uh, uh, observed people in Canada. They have to go under the, basically under the magnifying glass uh, on a daily basis because they are constantly being uh, scrutinized, make sure that they do not uh, do anything illegal. And one more thing is regarding how are you going to address the order in chamber that was uh, Mr. Trudeau's idea about uh, basically taking 1,500 legally owned firearms, the kinds of firearms, and make them illegal in a stroke of a pen. Thank you. Well, thanks for the question, George. And in fact, in the lower mainland of BC in the last few months, we've seen some very brazen uh, public shootings by criminal gangs. We've also seen this in Montreal. So we've seen a, an increase in gun violence with criminal organizations. And if you speak to police, which I do quite regularly, I have a lot of respect for people that, that put a uniform of service on and our first responders are our military, they will tell you that the firearms used in the commission of crimes come generally from smuggled U.S. sources. And in recent years, that smuggling has gotten worse. We, we've seen how the border has, has had 60,000 people in, in terms of Quebec crossing the border legally, illegally claiming asylum. We've also seen an increase 
in smuggling and contraband. That's where we need to focus our attention and also work with some of the ga guns and gang task forces in our major urban centers and have very strict rules, particularly when it comes to bail for people that have used a firearm in the commission of a crime to threaten violence or to harm people. What is, what is hard to understand is Mr. Trudeau is actually lowering criminal sanctions for the use of a firearm in the commission of crimes at, at a time we're seeing escalating gang violence. What we need to do is focus at public safety, not on dividing people. As you've said, the, the folks that, that hunt or sport shoot not only are screened, not only are trained, not only have licensing and, and storage and other commitments under their PAL, they are run through the CIPIC, the police system, on a daily basis. We know that they are not the, the problem with, with gun violence. But Mr. Trudeau uses the fact that there's divisions between rural and urban on who owns firearms, who understands our system of licensing and, and screening, um, and he tries to mislead people. It was tragic to see that after the horrible attack in Nova Scotia, which was committed by someone with a known public safety record who had obtained illegally smuggled firearms. That's why Mr. Trudeau tried to suppress a public inquiry of that terrible incident, because it didn't fit his political narrative. What I try and do is bring people together, and I think this is an area where we want to work with law enforcement, with municipalities, and, and with, with provinces, as well as with community groups to make sure that community safety is, is paramount. Our next question comes from Arnold. Uh, Arnold has a question about the Canadian Forces. Arnold, you can go ahead. You're live with Aaron O'Toole now. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. O'Toole. I am a retired military officer, and I re recall the proud days when we had our commitment to peacekeeping. Our, we were funding our military, probably not as much as we should have done, but we have now we have no procurement of, of aircraft. Uh, we have a seem to have a disgusting display of incompetence in withdrawing our allies out of Afghanistan. What would be your uh, take on the next approach to the Canadian Armed Forces and get our pride and value back? Well, first off, Arnold, thank you for your service in the Canadian Armed Forces. I, I served 12 years in the military, and I'm very fortunate. I didn't leave with a service injury. I like to say I took more out of the military than they took out of me. Michael also served in the reserves. And when I left, I said I always wanted to support our veterans, our men and women in uniform. And I've tried to do that as a volunteer in the private sector, as, an, as a backbench MP, as veterans minister, and I will do that as prime minister. And I'll tell you, we have a proud record of peacekeeping. And, and Mr. Pearson, Prime Minister Pearson, the last veteran who was also Prime Minister of the country wouldn't recognize the party of his old party under Mr. Trudeau. Mr. Trudeau has let down our allies, uh, doesn't have a serious approach when it comes to, to NATO or, or security, and hasn't, hasn't partnered with the U.S. on, on NORAD and on, on larger military cooperation issues. And the procurement situation is a complete disaster. I say this as a navigator from the Sea King helicopter, which you might remember, Arnold, the helicopter Mr. Kretschek cancelled for politics, paid contractual penalties, and we still needed a maritime helicopter. Mr. Trudeau did the same thing with the CF-18 replacement. Cancelled it in an election, has politicized it, and then what did they do, Arnold? They bought used jets from Australia. Only Justin Trudeau could replace the CF-18s bought by Pierre Trudeau with used CF-18s. It, it has literally turned us into the laughing stock of our close allies. And the situation in Afghanistan is heartbreaking for military families and veterans. I heard from a veteran friend of mine uh, about a week ago, he, he's heartbroken. He, he feels he's left part of himself in Afghanistan. And to see that Mr. Trudeau has abandoned some of our our translators and contractors are, th are there. And I can say that, Arnold, not being political, because I tried to work 
on this five years ago in a nonpartisan way. In fact, under John McCallum, when he did help us, a number of veterans and myself advocated to bring James Akam, a, a translator to Canada. He did it. I publicly praised him at the time. But Mr. Trudeau fired that minister, um, or retired him, <laughs> and I couldn't even get a response from other ministers. They ignored this problem for five years and now are scrambling. As Prime Minister, I will never abandon people that stood with us and served with us. That's not the Canadian way. We stand up for our, our friends, our interests, our values, and anyone that's at risk because of serving with Canada. So, Arnold, it's time for a change. And we'll take another question. This one comes from Joy on Vancouver Island, and it has to do with um, national unity. Joy, go ahead. You're live with Aaron O'Toole now. Hi, Aaron. Uh, thank you so much for putting this on. Um, I, my question is, over the last six years that we've had the Trudeau government, Canada seems to have become more and more polarized, more divided. And I'm curious to know how your government um, is planning on helping to bring us back together as one country instead of regions fighting against each other or, you know, disagreeing or, or you know, just, just hating each other. And, and um, I think that, you know, Canada seems to have lost a lot of its pride and unity. And, and how do you plan on addressing that? And before you answer, I just want to let you know that Raquel Dancho is my cousin. And I'm doing everything I, I, I'm doing everything I can to help Alana DeLong get elected. I'm her official agent. Well, thank you, Joy. Uh, help with Alana, and Raquel is, uh, is, a, is a star. She's a great member of the team. Look, I, I agree with you. I think we are in a very polarized time that, quite frankly, didn't exist six years ago. We didn't see active separation movements. Um, Canada had its challenges then, have them now, but I think we are the greatest country in the world. I think you can be proud of Canada and recommit to making Canada better which is why reconciliation with Indigenous peoples is important to me. We need to make real progress, not just have promises like Mr. Trudeau that you don't meet. I think we have to tackle inequalities. We have to tackle the opioid crisis and many of the challenges we face. But millions of Canadians have come here over waves of, of immigration over generations because of opportunity. And Canada still gives that. We need to keep breaking down barriers, but... Compare us to any other country in the world. Where would you want to live, work, raise a family, and retire? It's Canada. So I want to make sure we heal these divisions. That means respecting provinces and the ability for families to have work, including in the resource sector. It means respecting provincial jurisdiction and working together. Even in the last two days, Justin Trudeau in a political campaign is attacking other premiers to score points on me. That's a failure of leadership for someone that has let the party become so divided over six years. I will respect the provinces, partner with them, and make sure every part of our economy and every region of our country re recovers, which is why Canada's recovery plan was released on day two of this campaign. That's my commitment. And I think we as Canadians can unite behind securing the future and making sure no one's left behind. One premier said to Mr. Trudeau's Ottawa Knows Best approach that the, the federal government is not the parent to the children provinces. But the liberals have that, that arrogant approach, quite frankly, and we see it all the time. I will know areas where we need to have federal leadership and vision and jurisdiction, but I will also know that leadership is about partnering, is about collaborating, is about respecting and that's what we need in this country. I, I sincerely think we can very quickly restore people's faith in, in where we're headed, but we need leadership, we need a plan, and that's exactly what we're offering. Aaron, thank you for taking those questions this evening. I know that our Conservative team uh, from coast to coast to coast is ready to deliver Canada's recovery plan and to stand up for hardworking Canadians and their families. And that's why I'm glad you are leading Canada's Conservatives in this election.
Folks, we hope that you found tonight's conversation useful. And I'm going to ask one more time, if Aaron O'Toole and Canada's Conservatives can count on your vote, press 1 now. If you're supporting another party, press 2. And if you're still unsure of how you're going to vote, press 3. And if you didn't have a chance to ask your question, please stay on the line and leave a message for our staff. Your question is important, and we'd like to have the chance to get back to you. Well, thank you, Michael Barrett. Uh, thank you for your great work on, on ethics in the last parliament and for your work tonight. And thank you, everyone in British Columbia that joined our telephone town hall and asked me questions. We had uh, questions on climate change, on debt and deficits, on the situation with the BC fires. Richard fired one at me saying, are you going to meet with the, the provinces? He didn't think we'd taken climate change seriously enough. And I invite, as I do everyone, to hold us to account on our plan. And this is how I will be as Prime Minister, bringing people together, setting a plan, and making sure Canada strives to, to be the best it can be. And it is time to get British Columbia's economy back on track. We need a strong BC to secure the future of all of our country. Please check out our website. Look up our plan on our, our website and on Facebook. We're on Twitter and Instagram. And if you have any other questions, please send it in. We want to earn your vote. We need to secure the future after COVID-19. We need a plan, an ethical leader, and a motivated, incredible team. And that's what we have in BC. We hope we can count on your support. Thank you for participating. Good night.